So what you're looking at here are Walsh's molecular orbitals for cyclopropane. You see the, the shapes of the orbitals there, and you can see their energies off to the side, and they're arranged from lowest energy all the way up to highest energy. Now, considering these molecular orbitals brought in six electrons total, remember that methylene contributed, each methylene contributed two electrons to the molecular orbital um, additions, we would have six electrons in the resulting molecular orbitals, and I'll go ahead and draw those here. Two in the very bottom orbital, and then two each in these degenerate orbitals here. So in other words, the highest energy orbital containing electrons are either this one or this one. And that's important because we can use those orbitals as resonance donors. Remember that electron sources in resonance are high energy filled orbitals, and those two orbitals there are perfect examples. So let's take a closer look at the right-hand orbital and see how we can potentially use it in pi-type overlap. All right, so to explain the stability of the cyclo, uh, cyclopropyl methyl cation in terms of this resonance picture here, to make that jive with molecular orbitals, we need only zoom in on that orbital that I showed on the last slide. So here you're seeing that orbital, and what I'm showing here in the blue lines is the idea that the p orbital can delocalize into an adjacent um, empty p orbital if one exists. So each of these blue lines corresponds to a potential interaction with an adjacent orbital. Of course, on the parent cyclopropane, those adjacent atoms are just hydrogens. But if you imagine that we were looking at the cyclopropyl methyl cation, and one of these hydrogens was replaced by, say, a carbocation. Remember that carbocations possess empty p orbitals. We think of them as sp2 hybridized, typically, because they only contain three electron pair domains. The empty p orbital on the carbocation is now primed and ready to overlap with the adjacent lobe of the molecular orbital of cyclopropane. So that interaction tells us why this resonance picture is actually valid. We can actually think of that bond as donating into the positive charge of the CH2 group there. So hopefully this has convinced you that Walsh's model can be used to explain a number of, of uh, experimental observations that the simple banana bond picture really couldn't explain for us. Here are the molecular orbitals for you one more time. If you want to take a look at those, and if you want more details, there is a great website linked on the wiki that takes you through this process of building the molecular orbitals and has also some three-dimensional pictures of those orbitals if you're interested. But for now, that's all I've got to say for today. Next time we're going to look at ring strength, which is the idea that for the small rings, particularly cyclopropane and cyclobutane, instability can be introduced into the ring by chaining the two end atoms of the open chain form together. So what you're looking at here is an energy diagram with low energy stable molecules at the bottom, high energy unstable molecules at the top. And we see that cyclopropane is substantially higher in energy than propane, its open chain form. Tying the two carbons of propane together will actually introduce quite a bit of instability. And you can think about this in terms of deviations of cyclopropane from the ideal bond angle of 109.5 degrees. But that's all I've got for today. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you next time.